Welcome. Um, thank you for uh, joining us for this presentation. Uh, my name is Jamie Miles. I am Preservation Programs Associate with the Cleveland Restoration Society. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about mid-century modern architecture. Mid-century modern houses. Um, so this is more recently historic housing types. Um, we're going to place them in a historic context. Uh, talk a little bit about character defining features and then also at the end we're going to talk about how to address improvements and repairs for these types of houses. Uh, so first let's take a look at some housing stats and different catalysts that laid the foundation for a mid-century housing boom. So pre-war, uh, meaning talking about pre-World War II, so prior to World War II start in 1939, the United States was in the grips of the Great Depression. Um, and so I think we all have an understanding of the state of America during this period. But to give you an idea of the effect of the Depression in World War II on housing in the US, um, we can look at the numbers of housing stats. Uh, in 1925, there were nearly 1 million housing units created. But by 1933, uh, with the onset of the Great Depression, that number decreased uh, to only 93,000 housing units. So following the Great Depression was World War II, which had the effect of creating wartime shortages of materials that wiped out the possibility of housing numbers uh, rallying after the Depression ended. Uh, but then at the end of World War II in 1945, the U.S. began to enter a period of relative stability. The American people were eager to put the Depression and the war behind them. At the same time, 13 million veterans were returning home, creating a boom of demand for the American dream, namely a home of one's own on individual lots. Compared to the previous decade, economic times were improving drastically. Post-war brought a relatively robust economy. There was a high level of savings added to the pent-up demand and fact that the peacetime salaries were higher than pre-war, causing a relatively robust economy. Uh, housing production was made possible with the GI Bill of Rights uh, in 1944, which provided benefits for returning World War II vets, such as low-cost mortgages, low-interest loans to start a business, cash payments of tuition, and living expenses to attend college, high school, or vocational education. Then we also had the National Housing Act of 1949, which provided federal financing for slum clearance programs associated with urban renewal projects in American cities, um, increasing authorization for federal housing administration, mortgage insurance, um, and other government programs that essentially Im improved the possibility of housing construction in the country and made it possible uh, to fill that high demand that was created after the war. Um, so we also see a lot of smaller homes being built. High inflation nearly doubled the pre-war cost of building a home, uh, which resulted in generally smaller homes being built and a change of floor plans and how the home functions for a family, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Uh, so inexpensive suburban land was also a huge opportunity for these um, developers building these post-war housing uh, areas, suburban areas. Um, the federal work programs and federal highway system opened up suburban areas to development. The land there was cheaper than in the cities, resulting in a great opportunity for new developments. And here we see some examples of um, post-war uh, highway projects, such as the Ohio Turnpike. Um, the accessibility of autom automobiles and the increase of automobile culture was also a had a huge impact on the way that housing developments were designed and constructed after the war. Um, the accessibility of cars allowed more people to live outside of the cities and commute in rather than needing to live close by in streetcar suburbs or in, in downtown areas. So, um, all these things, you know, were having an impact on housing developments after World War II. But what did post-war homeowners really want in their houses? You know, we talked about how the houses were getting smaller. 
but what kind of impact did um you know consumer you know desires have on the design of these houses so homeowners really wanted a home of their own they wanted a smaller house size something that wasn't too expensive but also something you know along the more traditional lines um so, you know, we see homeowners wanting kind of these new modern conveniences, but they also want that feel of something that um, still has that the traditional characteristics, which we'll see a little bit later here in the presentation. Um, we see a lot of informal interior spaces, things like family rooms, a yard, a backyard for the children. Um, like I said, modern conveniences, especially in the kitchen. Um, also a place for your new television. Uh, a garage for the new family car, and then something, you know, as we were saying, the suburban land is opening up, something away from the city, something that is going to, um, you know, so that allow a person to commute into the city rather than be directly in the city among the busy, the busy city life. And so, you know, this was the birth of the typical suburban housing that we think of uh, when we see a 1950s suburb. We're going to talk a little bit about the genesis of the mid-century modern style. How did we get to the suburbs and the houses we know now as mid-century and what are the results? So early in the 19th century, Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie style leads to the influence of the post-war ranch with long horizontal lines, cantilevered roofs, and large windows that bring the outside into a little bit later, also in the early 1900s, kind of along the same time period as Frank Lloyd Wright is pioneering this prairie style, uh, we see the bungalow. Um, the Craftsman bungalow was an influential style which redefined the use of space in the home and maximized square footage. Simplified floor plans were desired as well as a loss of servants um, and a move away from Victorian excess. So in this example, on the left there, we can see example an example of a Victorian style floor plan. Um, and you can kind of tell it's kind of complex. You know, the flow is, uh, you know, there are a lot of little nooks and crannies in the house. We have the little pantry in the corner. Um, and then in a lot of Victorian houses, as I mentioned, we would have like a servant staircase in the back along with the main stair in the front. Um, but then on the right is an example of a craftsman bungalow floor plan. It's, as you can see, it's a lot more simplified, um, you know, very distinct areas of the home. The bedrooms are on the second floor. The first floor has the dining flowing into the living room and then the kitchen in the other corner. So it's very much more simplified. Um, so the modernistic style period, when this style comes about more in the 1920s and 30s, there's several things to address. Um, the Bauhaus School, Walter Gropius and Mies van der Rohe, all architects that had a huge impact on um, the modern movements to come. Uh, we see an emergence of Art Deco and international styles. Um, some of the influential and concepts and elements at this time include paradigm construction, lack of ornamentation. Um, we see a lot of ribbon windows up in the, as like in the Gropius house up there, um, sort of expansive, you know, areas of glass um, and truth in construction. So like we see in the Farnsworth house down in the bottom corner, you know, what you see is what you get. You see the support beams, you see the ceiling, you see the floor, and that is the truth of the construction right there. The style had a small period of popularity and most often in high style. So people who, you know, had the money to afford to hire an architect to design a house specifically for them who are constructing these types of homes. But nonetheless, these types of architects, this style had a huge influence on the um, more vernacular mid-century modern houses to come. Um, so then in 1933, we have the Chicago World's Fair. And at the World's Fair, there is this exhibition called Homes of Tomorrow. Um, this showcased the man's modern innovations in architecture, science, design, and building materials and transportation. Um, two of the homes showcased uh, at the Homes of Tomorrow exhibition had Cleveland roots. Um, and I have those examples up here. We have the Brick House, um, 
and that was created by the Brick Manufacturing Association of America, and they're from Cleveland. And then we also had the Armco Faro Mayflower House, and many of the um, contractors and companies that went into the construction of that house were also from Cleveland. And these are both examples of just what the modern uh, design was doing at this time. Um, as we can see, you know, many modern materials, you know, new types of manufacturing were being used in the production of these homes. Uh, so Mar Marcel Brewer's Geller House or by Nuclear House illustrates the concept that there should be separate spaces for quiet and active living. We later see this detail as part of the split level and range style homes, um, which I'll get into a little bit later, but this was a super influential idea in mid-century modern housing. Between 1950 and 1974, Joseph Eichler's company, Eichler Homes, built over 11,000 homes in Northern California and Southern California. They all came to be known as Eichler's or an Eichler, kind of iconic in that way. Eichler homes were from a branch of modernist architecture that has come to be known as California modern, and they typically feature glass walls, post and beam construction, and open floor plans in a style indebted to Flankward Wright and Mies van der Rohe. Just like I mentioned, you know, with those modernist um, styles and a couple slides ago, you know, the truth in construction. Then we have these big cantilevers like with Frank Lloyd Wright. All of these architects are coming to influence, you know, what becomes a more accessible style for modern families. Um, one of Eichler's signature concepts was to bring the outside in. And this was achieved via skylights and floor to ceiling glass windows with glass transoms looking out on protected and private outdoor rooms, patios, atriums, gardens, and swimming pools. Also of note is that most Eichler homes feature few, if any, front facing, that is street facing windows. With those that do exist being either small ceiling level windows or small rectangular windows with frosted glass, which is contrary to most other architectural designs which have almost all front-facing front rooms featuring large windows. From these influences emerged a major motifs of influential pre-war housing, including an open floor plan, organic shapes, clean lines, a nod to the past, um, and then things like the Ladies' Home Journal and the Sears and Roebuck catalogs were really influencing design around this time. Trendsetters um, and features prefabricated homes, um, you know, like I, I mentioned, the Ladies' Home Journal and the Sears catalogs, those were really influencing designs around 1908 to 1940. Several prefab housing companies picked up on these motifs and trends. Um, and this, you know, many of you, of you have heard, I'm sure have heard of the Levittown homes. William Levitt was a U.S. Navy CB and Alfred Levitt was an architectural draftsman. Their vision for housing construction led to mass production of housing on a grand scale. Levittown is con considered the first mass produced suburb. Remarkably, the company built 17,450 houses on Long Island between 1947 and 1951, on th only three years, I'm sorry, four years. Uh, so they took an assembly line approach to production and to on-site construction. They used a combination of traditional styling and modern construction techniques. Their mass production system included pre-cut lumber, pipes, and copper coils for the radiant heated concrete slabs. By 1950, Levitt's crews were erecting a house every 16 minutes. That's incredible. The earliest Levittown capes had four rooms and one bathroom. Modern siding like Amazonite or cemented asbestos boards with shingles were dominant. Dormers, corner windows, and picture windows, typically all steel casements, were the only architectural embellishment on these and many post-war capes. Later, Levitt homes were larger, had carports, and were closer to the ranch in form. So we see kind of an evolution from this smaller Cape Cod style home later to the long, you know, rambling ranch style homes. More locally known is the manufacturer Lester Corporation from Columbus, Ohio. The concept behind these prefab homes were the factory-built porcelain enamel steel panels. They were erected on prepared concrete slabs in three and a half days, and there were approximately 2,500 total constructed, so there were a few left today that are completely intact. They're super in around Ohio. 
we also have um, the Gunnison homes, which also incorporated assembly line methods developed in the automotive industry. Uh, they were operated from 1936 to 1953, a building manufactured housing, um, and they then became later U.S. steel homes. A major component of the Gunnison homes was construction using stressed wood panels. So, you know, as kind of an overview, we see an evolution of styles over, you know, the early 1900s to the mid-century. Um, 1900 to 1920, we have the bungalows, Foursquare, Prairie, and Art Deco type houses. Um, then 1920 to 1940, we start to see these eclectic, eclectic revivals like Tudor revivals, colonial revivals. These are really popular around that area, era. And then 1935 to 1965, we see a slow transition to new building styles with these, you know, minimalist Cape Cods and then, you know, slowly converting to more ranch style homes. So some of the common styles of the mid-century modern era, we, like I mentioned, we see these minimal traditional, you know, some Cape Cods and some slowly converting over to ranch style homes. Um, the dominant front gable and massive chimneys, um, low or intermediate roof pitches with eaves, um, being, and then they were often built of brick, wood, or stone, or a combination of the three. But we see really minimal de architectural detail in many of these homes. So 1935 to 1975, we see um, a lot, the ranch coming into popularity at this time. They were based on the 19th century Western houses and, like I said, influenced greatly by Wright and the Prairie School ideals. This is perhaps the ultimate symbol of the post-war American dream. Uh, they were asymmetrical, one-story forms with low-pitched roofs. Um, they featured picture windows, of windows for bedrooms, a combination of different siding materials, shallow porches, and garage doors with accented details, as we see here. And speaking of garages, you may have noticed in the past two slides the emergence of a prominent garage. The front porch of the home had been forsaken for a backyard patio. Now the front of the home is devoted to the garage, a necessity due to the popularity of the automobile. And they really had fun with the garage doors, as you can see here. Um, then also we have, you know, as I mentioned before, the Cape Cod. Even though it is not the symbol of mid-century architecture, the Cape Cod, I think, shows a direct reflection of the post-war objectives, small in size and functional. They had eating kitchens, a large living room. Um, they offered optional finished attics like Levittown and a basement as an additional living space. Um, in sort of the later part of the mid-century, we start to see split levels. Generally, split levels have two wings, three levels and no true basement. Most commonly used building materials were brick and wood framing. Exterior materials included asbestos cement shingles, plywood, or wood shingles and clapboards. Windows in the one-story living room portion typically include a picture window, which is large and often bow-fronted. Um, they had a low-pitched roof, horizontal lines, and overhanging eaves. Uh, also, double front doors uh, are common on later examples of these homes. Ideally, they took advantage of sloping lots because you could build them, you know, they were generally deeper on one end and you could build them up, you know, towards the uphill area. And later examples often have cross gable garage uh, forming the entry court. Um, so these are kind of really interesting examples of how designers would combine, you know, aspects of the ranch style and also, you know, a traditional elements um, as we see, like we have shutters on these split levels in this slide. We also start to see um, some contemporary style houses at this time. Um, they're identified by a flat or gabled roof shape. The flat roof subtype is influenced by the international style of the 20s, um, and both subtypes lack orna ornamental detailing. White stucco wall surfaces in early examples are replaced by different combinations of brick, wood, or stone in later examples. Um, and incorporation into the landscape was stressed with these, you know, trying to be as flat and blended with nature as much as possible. 
We also see um, contemporary gabled examples also in the later part of the mid-century. The gabled subtype is influenced by the craftsman and prairie styles and features include overhanging eaves, often with exposed roof beams. Heavy piers occasionally supported gables. If we've learned anything about mid-century modern architecture, hopefully you take away low horizontal planes as the design emphasis with minimal details. Floor planes are casual and open um, with a mix used and indoor and outdoor blend simultaneously, uh, seamlessly. Let's take a look at some other distinctive design features though for mid-century modern houses. So on the interior, something that became really common was um, room dividers. We had different materials, so corrugated glass, metalwork with geometric designs, and also modern fold doors were used to separate space, large spaces into smaller areas. Sometimes space was sacrificed for modern systems and conveniences like additional storage. Enameled steel or wood cabinets were popular in mid-century kitchens, and this was very important, you know, for um, the traditional housewife to stay at home and enjoy her kitchen. Mid-century furnishings, um, you know, furniture and having styled furniture became a really big deal in the mid-century modern era. There was an increased emphasis on ergonomic comfort and well-designed lower cost furniture like the Ames folded fiberglass chairs as we see in the bottom corner. Mid-century lighting often looked like space age, uh, you know, type designs. Uh, we, you know, in, in industrial design really kind of was um, kind of had like a boom in the mid-century modern era. Wall coverings uh, were either in coveted or, you know, just really interesting patterns. And they had some interesting names, like um, these are some of the Bradbury examples, Atomic Doodle Turquoise, Interlock Silver, Gigi Sage, and Googieland Turquoise. Mid-century flooring. Um, we had a lot of really different materials, you know, um, different invented manufactured types of flooring in this era. Um, Amtico, Amtico, Amtico rubber flooring in 1951 created a resilient product portfolio of luxury vinyl tile. About 1950, it was as if someone had opened up a magic trunk and out of the trunk came man-made fibers, new spinning techniques and new dye equipment printing processes, tufting equipment, and backing for different end uses of carpet. Wood, wool broadloom, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting became popular. So, you know, in the mid-century, we have large expanses of windows. We have these um, uh, picture windows in the fronts of houses, and these big, you know, large expanses of glass need, certainly need window treatments, um, especially in our climate. Synthetic fabrics, rayon and viscose, employed for were employed for easy care um, for you know curtains um, we also have things that like the um, the traverse curtain rod uh, in 1928 um, which you know was not really put into use until we had these big you know uh, picture windows in the mid-century but um, that really came in handy at that time so, Mid-century modern homes were extremely cutting edge. You know, they were putting a lot of new manufacturing techniques into use, um, but they also presented challenges for preservation, um, especially now that these homes are aging. Uh, they, and the materials, these newer, what materials were new at that time are now aging. Um, and so we have to figure out how do we go about preserving these homes? Um, also, energy efficiency was not necessarily a focus in the mid-century, meaning that 1950s homes, many, many of them now have issues with energy efficiency. The focus of efficiency of these homes is the windows, so the challenge becomes, how do we make these homes energy efficient, sustainable, and yet preserve their architectural integrity? Replacement materials are not readily made and sometimes expensive. 
The use of decorative glass block, permastone, and other veneers and metals may no longer be available, cost prohibitive, or have fallen out of favor. We also have to acknowledge the materials may not be durable or sustainable these days. For example, um, the asbestos tile. We don't want to be producing something that has, you know, that asbestos content in it today. So how do we go about, you know, replacing those products or making a similar product that's going to have to be custom made, that's going to be perhaps cost prohibitive for many people. So now I'm going to get into talking a little bit how to repair and improvement projects. And, you know, this is um, kind of focused on mid-century houses, but also it's relevant. You'll see, you know, other housing styles I reference in this section. So any old house owner can use these tricks and tips. So something that you're going to want to think about when you're approaching a rehab project, especially if you're going to do something that has an effect, um, you know, on the architectural characteristics of the house. Um, you want to think about what are the important character defining features of the house and do the architectural features that are present fit a specific style? And if so, what architectural style is it? I mean, do you have a like California ranch house with, um, you know, beautiful open picture windows in the front? Um, if so, you're going to want to maintain that in any kind of rehab project that you're approaching. All right, in approaching um, a rehab project, you're also going to want, in addition to style, you're going to want to think about massing and how if what you're doing is going to affect the massing of the house, especially if you're doing an addition, this is something you would want to think about. Um, so is your house long and low or is it tall? Um, is it symmetrical or asymmetrical? Are projections or bays part of the style? And how does it sit on the surrounding land, you know? Um, or on the surrounding yard, you know, or how does it, the neighbor's houses, how does it appear within the neighborhood is something you want to take into consideration. Materials are also something um, to think about, you know, what is the house made of? What was the technique used? Should the materials be repaired or replaced? And are the materials there already, are they original um, and appropriate? Or, you know, is something there that was an incompatible repair made by someone 30 years ago. Um, so these are some more examples of best practice guidelines, maybe some things that you don't really want to do if you are thinking about make, doing a rehab project. Um, you know, improvements don't necessarily always make it better, especially when it comes to windows and window replacements or taking out windows altogether. The wrong repair or the repair person can do more harm than good, especially when it comes to mortar repair and tuck pointing. You want to make sure that you're using the right material with the right material. When applying architectural details, you want to make sure that they are appropriate for the style of the home and then choose the best size or style. So for example, shutters are something that you really want to make sure fit the windows that you're putting the shutters on. Um, you know, in the right, the length does not fit the window. It would not necessarily be appropriate. And then on the left there, we see a shutter that, you know, is not, clearly not a functional shutter, but um, if it were functional, it wouldn't even cover the window. So that's something that you wanna maybe think about with architectural details. Um, scale should always be considered. Like I was talking about massing earlier. Um, this is an example where, you know, we have a super incompatible addition that does not match the scale of the original house. And it's pretty obvious that it's, you know, an incompatible addition. Um, so post-war and mid-century modern houses also, you know, although there can be preservation issues with them, they do present a lot of opportunities, um, especially in this day and age. Post-war residences tell a unique story of important housing trends both in the distinctive architectural styles and forms that developed and in new size and design of subdivisions to meet explosive housing demands. Today, there's a renewed interest in modern architecture and homes of the recent past. Mid-century housing remains accessible and affordable, but it also needs to be seen as valuable. Um, today, there's, like I said, there's a new interest in these modern styles, new interest in sustainability and renewable resources, um, for example, like solar panels. Um, 
And, you know, many times uh, these mid-century housing uh, can cost, you know, can have a lower cost than some of these great big Victorian mansions, um, but also be just as architecturally beautiful in a different way. Um, so now I'm going to plug us Cleveland Restoration Society's Heritage Home Program. If you have uh, never heard of it before, uh, the Heritage Home Program kind of has two main parts. They have the free technical assistance and then also low interest loans for financing. Um, the technical assistance uh, comes as impartial advice with a preservation approach to maintenance, repair, and improvements on houses over 50 years old in participating communities. And you can visit the Heritage Home Program website to find out if you are in a participating community. Um, as part of the technical assistance, we offer site visits with our construction specialists to review any and all issues with the home. Um, we can help you with project prioritization and also give referrals for contractors and help with reviewing estimates. Um, we can also offer restoration guidance if you're thinking of doing something, um, you know, that where you want to maintain the architectural integrity of your house. Um, and then the low interest financing part, we do offer fixed rate financing as low as 2% um, in suburbs outside Cleveland, but as low as 1.4% in the city to cover project costs. Interior and exterior products both qualify for the loan, um, as well as DIY projects. And we do offer construction specifications for exterior projects, just to make sure that um, any work that's being done is in alignment with um, the architectural characteristics of the older home. Um, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the program about mid-century modern architecture, and you can feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions at all. Thank you.